Great to have you back and what we will learn in this lesson is how to calculate the potential around and inside various surfaces and the concept of equipotential surfaces. So let's move on with the first item and measure the potential around a charged sphere, a charged infinite wire and lastly a charged ring. So let us go ahead and find the electric potential around a sphere that has a charge Q put on the surface and we know that excess charge placed on an isolated conductor will distribute itself evenly on the surface of that conductor and that's what happens here too. Now we've already established E in and outside a charge sphere. What we got was this and we will make use of this to establish the potential at various points as well. So when measuring potential outside the sphere, we can assume the sphere to be like a point charge with charge Q and we can directly use the formula for potential due to charge Q that is 1 upon 4 pi epsilon Q by R and we see that the potential will be 0 when R is at infinity and increase as R reduces and at R equal to R it equals 1 by 4 pi epsilon Q by capital R. Now inside the sphere E is 0 which means that electric force is 0 and if you could somehow push a unit charge inside the sphere through a small hole in the sphere what you'll find is that no work needs to be done in moving it to any point inside since there is no electric force inside and since the definition of potential different states that the potential difference between two points is the work done by an electric force in moving a unit charge from one point to another the potential difference between any two points becomes zero. This means that if work done is zero all points must be at the same potential. So let us find what is the potential inside the sphere. But before we do that what is important for you to remember is that there is potential inside the sphere but it is the same at all points. Hence the potential difference is zero between any two points inside a sphere. So if we use the equation that determines the potential difference between two points and put E equal to zero for cases inside the sphere, we see that VB equals VA and if we take VB as any point R on the surface of the sphere, what we find is that any VA inside the sphere would also be VB or this expression. Hence, any point inside the sphere has the same potential as that on the surface of the sphere and therefore we get a straight line here. So the next example is one where we find the potential at any distance r from a long wire that has linear charge density lambda. Now we know that electric field at a distance r for such a wire is given as er is equal to lambda by 2 epsilon r and we will make use of this formula to find the potential at any point r. What we observe is that since the field has radial component only so E and any displacement of unit charge dL are always parallel or the angle between them is 0 and cos of 0 becomes 1. Then E dot dL will always be E dL or in this case ER dR. Then we can say that potential at any point say A with respect to potential at B is integral E at R dr integrated between A and B. And if we go ahead and put the expression for E R as lambda divided by 2 pi epsilon R and integrate between R A and R B, what we get is this. Now if you are dealing with a long charged object, which we often term as infinitely long, you should take a reference potential V B at some finite distance from the wire. Let us take this reference potential VB equal to zero at a distance R0. Then we can say that V is equal to lambda by 
2 pi epsilon ln of r naught upon r. So let us do a quick check on this formula. And we see if r increases, v value decreases. And that should be the case since potential always decreases as we move in the direction of the electric field. Well, if we were to extend this derivation to a long cylinder with lambda as charge distribution per unit length, we can use the same formula but only for r values outside the cylinder or r greater than or equal to capital R. And if we take r naught as equal to r, it would mean that V would equal zero at the surface of the cylinder when we put R equal to capital R. Again, since E is zero inside the cylinder, the potential also will be the same as on the surface or zero. Let us now go ahead and find what is the potential at a distance X from the center of a thin ring that has charge Q distributed on it. So here what we'll do is divide up the ring into very small parts such that each part has a charge dQ and use the equation V is equal to U by Q naught that is 1 by 4 pi epsilon Q by R but then we take dQ as the Q value in this equation and use integration to sum up the contribution of potential from each small part of the ring. We also note that the distance of each element dq from p is r and therefore a constant here that can be taken out and if we put r is equal to under root x square plus a square we can write this expression as 1 upon 4 pi epsilon root of x square plus a square integral of dq which we know then equals 1 by 4 pi epsilon capital Q by under root x square plus a square. Well, we could do a little testing of this equation and take x value much higher than a. In that case, this expression reduces to 1 by 4 pi epsilon Q by x. That is basically potential due to a point charge Q at a distance x, which is in line with what we have derived earlier that is at very long distance the ring starts looking like a point charge to the observer and you would recall that we drew a similar result for electric field of a ring as well. Now let us end this lesson with a very simple concept that is equipotential surfaces. So what really are equipotential surfaces? So as the word says equipotential surfaces are those surfaces that have equal or same potential. These can be imaginary surfaces or sometimes real physical surfaces too. And if you go by the equation that connects work done on a charge and the change in potential, what you will see is that if you take two points on an equipotential surface and move a unit charge from point A to B, no work is done since potential at A is equal to potential at B, making this expression zero and therefore the work done also becomes zero. And you would also realize that since work done is path independent, you can move the charge from A to B taking any path. That is, you can move it in a crazy curve or go up and down, but as long as your destination is B from A, the change in potential will be zero and therefore the work done will also be zero. And here is a setup where you have a bunch of equipotential surfaces so that all points on this surface are at some potential say V1 and potential of all points on this surface is also the same say V2 and so on for other surfaces as well. Then if you move a charge say from point A to B on surface 1, you know that electric field does zero work since both the points are on the same surface and equipotential. But what if you took this route to move from A to B? Would there be work done? Of course not, since as we said earlier that work done is path independent and as long as the start and end point is the same, the work done is zero 
since the potential at A and B are the same. Also, if you move from one surface with say potential V1 to another surface with potential V2, then work done would be the same for any path you take and any initial or final point you take between the two surfaces. So if you take this path, the formula for work done is Q times V2 minus V1. And if you take this path, the work done again is Q V2 minus V1. So you see that the work done when you move between equipotential surfaces is the same. I'm sure you got the point, but just to play around with the idea a little more, if we move a unit charge from A to B and during its journey at a certain point, say here, E was not perpendicular to the surface and was at an angle of 80 degrees instead, what you'll find is that E would have a component in the horizontal direction and that would be E cos 80 degrees. And the moment you have a force vector like this, along the line of displacement, work will be done. And in this case, it would be E cos 80 dl, which would be a non-zero value, which again is not possible since no work can be done between A and B. And so the angle between E and the surface at every point has to be 90 degrees. So that brings us to the end of this lesson. And if you feel you have any doubt about a particular part in this lesson, leave your question or comments below and I'll try to answer them as soon as possible.